Okay, welcome to today's uh, event, Syrian Voices from the 2023 Earthquake, Emergency Responses and Long-Term Impact. It's good to see so many of you here in person, and I'm glad others of you have been able to join on the webinar online. Uh, I'm Bonnie Doherty. I'm the uh, lecturer on law in the International Human Rights Clinic and director of the Armed Conflict and Civilian Protection Initiative, which is, is part of the clinic. And I'll be moderating a conversation with four experts in which we'll address the effects specifically in Syria of the February 6th earthquake of magnitude 7.8, um, which is, and we'll also examine the challenges of the response, which have been complicated by Syria's 12 year armed conflict and resulting mass displacement and humanitarian crisis. Two of our panelists will share their eyewitness experiences from Syria, and two will provide their expertise on the international response. Uh, before I introduce them, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Armed Conflict and Civilian Protection Initiative, the International Human Rights Clinic, the Middle East and North African Law Student Association Program and Law and Society in the Muslim World. And two practical measures. Um, first, the event will be recorded. And second, after our discussion, we'll open the floor to questions. For those in the room, you should raise your hand and uh, and which you like to find the shows up. Um, and but if not, I'll repeat the questions for you. And those on the webinar can submit questions via the Q and A function um, on the Zoom on Zoom. So let me briefly introduce our four speakers before we start our conversation. Obviously, there's a lot more I could say, but I'll give you brief introductions in the order that they'll first speak. Um, Dr. Abdul Karim Xayez is a Syrian medical medical doctor epidemiologist and general secretary of the Syrian British Medical Society. He's done extensive research into public health impacts of conflict and is currently doing work at King's College London on strengthening health systems in conflict settings. He was trained to be a neurosurgeon in 2013 when his residency was interrupted by the war in Syria. And he then joined Save the Children where he led the health response until 2017. He's also supported rebuilding a health system in opposition controlled areas of Syria using a bottom up approach. Mohammed Asi lives in the countryside of Idlib. He's now 28 years old and was injured in 2013 when the Syrian government planes bombed a school in Urm el Kubra with incendiary weapons. These weapons caused burns over 80% of his body. And um, I, he's been very helpful in working on the uh, efforts to strengthen the law against incendiary weapons. He has since worked in the provision of humanitarian services, services with a number of volunteer teams and local non-governmental organizations in Northwest Syria. He will speak through interpretation, and I want to thank Susan Abayad for helping out with that. Amar El Selmo is a graduate of the University of Aleppo and worked as an English teacher and volunteer first aid provider before joining the Syrian civil, Syria Civil Defense also known as the White Helmets in April 2013. He established White Helmet Center in Al Safara and later Aleppo's Old City, and has since served in various positions in the organization, including as Aleppo director manager and a member of the board of directors. He's also joining us from Syria. And finally, Alexandra Tarzakhan. Alex grew up in Aleppo, Syria, and has worked in refugee camps in Jordan, Lebanon, and Greece. She's now a refugee rights advocate and founder of the Meet a Refugee social media platform, which is aimed at sharing stories about the, um, about the cause. She has over five years experience working in human rights advocacy, humanitarian operations, and global health with a focus on forced displacement, conflict affected settings, and climate change. She's also a legal advisor for the MENA region with the ABA Center for Human Rights in DC. So I now want to turn it over to our experts um, to have, who should be the focus of this discussion. And first, I'll talk to you, start with you, Dr. Abel Karim, um, with a sort of background question. Of what was the humanitarian situation in Northwest Syria before the earthquake? And what were the pre-existing challenges with aid delivery? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on this panel. And thank you for shedding a light on this important um, topic on the earthquake in northwest of Syria, because the focus has been, especially in the first, let's say, week 
after the earthquake, um, the focus has been on southern Turkey, which was you know uh, hugely impacted by the earthquake. But then um, the area of northwest of Syria received less attention, and I think this is um, this might be mainly because having no um, governmental representation of this of this uh, area, and that's why it is important to differentiate within northwest of Syria between two areas of control in relevance to your uh, question. So the first area, which is under opposition control, and the other one under the Assad regime control, under Damascus government. And the most of the areas affected by the earthquake were under the opposition control, although there were some areas, for example, Aleppo city or Hamas city under the regime control also were affected, but the majority of the impact had uh, struck the opposition controlled areas. And this area has been, you know, suffering from 12 years of the conflict. And because this area has been the last stronghold for opposition forces, the area witnessed the majority of attacks by the Syrian regime and their allies, destroying most of the civilian infrastructure in the in the area. We're talking about residential buildings or hospitals, health facilities, bakeries, schools. Most of these facilities were attacked, you know, regularly by the Syrian regime and their allies. The Physicians for Human Rights, as uh, as of November last year. They documented 630 attacks on health facilities in, in opposition health areas mainly, and about 70 or 80 percent of these attacks took place in the um, opposition controlled areas in northwest of Syria. So the infrastructure in this area was fragile because of the conflict itself. The other, the other reality in this area is about population density. And most of this population are, are internally displaced persons. And here in the area, we have about 4.5 million population. Uh, about 70 to 80% of them are internally displaced. And the area received a lot of um, displacements from different areas in Syria. Because whenever Assad um, take over any of the opposition controlled areas in any part of the country, there will be waves of displacement arriving to northwest of Syria. And those people are vulnerable in terms of lacking the basic livelihood and also uh, in terms of um, you know suffering from several um, uh, displacement throughout the last few years and lastly about um, the uh, these services in this area um, the area relies heavily on the humanitarian cross-border response which um, is described to be the lifeline of, of this area. So the area since 2014 has been receiving cross-border response from Turkey, led by the UN agencies and other international and national organizations. And this was under a resolution by the Security Council, which was in July 2014, allowing the UN agencies and their partners to deliver aid across the border. Unfortunately, the status of this cross-border humanitarian response was uh, unstable in the last few years because of the veto of the Russians and the Chinese. In 2019, the Russians vetoed a resolution to deliver aid across the border in northwest and northeast of Syria, and they instead agreed to deliver to have this um, resolution only for six months and only for one crossing point, which is Bab al Hawa from um, into from Turkey into northwest of Syria. So before the earthquake, the um, the, reli the reliability of the cross border response was under question. And after the earthquake, the border was closed for about two and a half days. The only uh, crossing point for humanitarian aid was closed for two, for two and a half days, which affected massively the emergency response in this area. So in a nutshell, the area was fragile, uh, the infrastructure was weak, the population were vulnerable, and the last thing they, they really needed was a natural disaster at, at such scale. Thank you very much. And that gives a sense of the sort of dire situation even before, before the earthquake. Uh, Mohammed, um, I know you lived through the February 6th earthquake. And first of all, I wanna express my um, concern for you and your family. And I hope you have stayed as safe as possible under the circumstances. 
Can you tell us what you personally experienced on the day of the earthquake? Mohammed, I am in the Kaisha Zizel, said the Febrier, but Ahmed and Tukun Anta were either to be a man, Kodrama Elimkan, Fidel Hadihi, a wolf. Harim Kanaka and Tahaberna, Maisht, Hadakarium, Uma Aisht, P. Walter Zizel. Okay. Vidae uh, Marhaba. يعطيكم العافية جميعا يوم الزلزال كان فينا نوصفه كأنه يوم القيامة Thank you all and hello I would like to describe the day of the earthquake as if it was the judgment day في الداية لما حدث الزلزال كان أغلب العائلات في بيوتها أنه حدث في ساعات, في ساعات الفجر الأولى أدى هذا الأمر أنه صار عداد الضحايا كبيرة كتير تحت الأنقاض كنت نايم أنا وعائلتي فبلش البيت يهز فينا So most of the people during this time the earthquake hit in the early dawn hours in the morning and around 4 a.m. most people were already in their house sleeping so most people were affected during the, from this earthquake. Me and my family were in the house sleeping during this time when we started feeling the house shaking. Abi can, خلينا نقول, هو معاق عنده بتر في الإجر وأم كبيرة بالعمر هذا طبعاً بعد ما تعرضنا لقصف أيضاً ثاني بأورم الكبرى تعرض أبي لبتر قدمه من قبل نظام الأسد القصف كان في اللحظة أنا قلت إنه ليش بدي أعيش لوحدي أهرب أنجو بحياتي لوحدي لازم خلاص خليني ضل مع أهلي مع أهلي يا موت سوا يا من عيش سوا. Okay, so my dad is already disabled. He has lost his leg from previous Assad shelling, and my mom is also is an older lady. So once the house started shaking, I thought to myself, why should I escape just by myself and then have to live alone? I might as well just stay here, and if we all live, we all live together. If we die, we all die together. انتظرنا لحتى خلاص الزلزال الأول خرجنا من المنزل حملت أبي أنا وأخي وهربنا كنا تحت المطار في الشارع نهار صار بطولات مطرية شديدة بقينا تقريبا لساعة تسعة الصبح تحت المطر بالصدمة الأولى كنا ما أنا متوقعين أنه يكون صار انهيارات أبنية في المنطقة بشكل كبير أو صار ضحايا بشكل كبير العالم كلها كانت في الشارع خايفة أنه ترجع بيوتها Yes, so once the first earthquake stopped my brother and I carried my father and we went down to the streets and at the streets we found most of the people from the neighborhood were all sitting outside and it was raining and we sat outside with my, I sat outside with my family until around eight o'clock in the morning. And at first I didn't imagine the destruction that this earthquake had created. I didn't, we couldn't imagine the number of victims that were caused by this earthquake. بعدين بلشت توصل المناشدات من قبل الدفاع المدني ومن قبل الأهالي إنه في عداد كبيرة من الأبنية المهدمة في مدن كاملة سوية بالأرض بحتاجين لتبرع بالدم محتاجين لأليات تتساعد بهذا الأمر بعد ما طمأننا إنه هدت الموجة الزلزالية قليلا إنه الهزات الارتدادية الممكن تجي هي خفيفة نوعا ما رجعنا للبيت ولكن خلينا نقول إنه رجعنا للبيت بشكل خائف إنه كنا مستعدين في أي لحظة للخروج منه خلينا نقول إنه صدمة كبيرة أبي تعرض لمرض أبصفار أو رهاب من أثر الزلزال. Yes. So at first, like I said, we didn't, we weren't aware of the level of destruction that the earthquake caused. After a couple hours, we started receiving messages and news, news from news outlets and also from social media saying that from the White Helmet specifically about the level of destruction. We saw that there was entire cities that were reduced to rubble and they were asking for blood donations. 
after staying out for a couple more hours and sort of waiting out the aftershocks of the event, we decided to hesitantly return home. We returned home, but again, very, very hesitantly. And we were sort of expecting at any moment that we were going to pack up our things and run again. Again, it caused such an emotional shock and my dad suffered from multiple anxiety attacks because of this. Oh. تمام آه بعدين بلشنا نساعد آه فرق الدفاع المدني والجمعيات المحليه بانتشار الضحايا شفت كثير من الجثث امام عيوني كيف عم تطلع وهي متعرضه للهرس وشفنا كثير من المعجزات اللي صارت بسوريا آه وبتركيا اخراج عدد كبير من الناجين كانوا بوضع جيد وعدد ثاني من الناجين اللي خرجوا كانت اصاباتهم شديده آه الى الان هن عم يعانوا بالمشافي السوريه بنقص حاد بالمشافي بسوريا وخصوصا في شمال غرب سوريا المنطقه المقيمين فيها so once once images and videos started circulating on social media we started seeing again the, the number of victims that were caused by this earthquake but similar to seeing the number of victims we also saw miracle stories as well we saw people being removed from the rubble after hours or days of being stuck and we also saw the sort of the hardship of the medical attention that a lot of these victims required and the destruction that was specifically in northwest Syria which is where I am at يعني فيكم تخيلوا انه المنطقة هي بالاساس منكوبة معتمدة خلينا نقول 80% على المساعدات الانسانية والمساعدات الاممية لحتى تقدر تقوم مع اجريها الشعب اكثره تحت خط الفقر بالاضافه لذلك المشافي اكثر مشافي مموله من الامم المتحده والمنظمات الدوليه وتعرضت لهي الكارثه العظيمه يعني تركيا كدوله اقتصاديه قويه وصلت للحظات شعرت فيها بالعجز امام الكارثه اللي اصابتها فما بالكم بشمال غرب سوريا so as you can imagine northwest syria has already suffered from multiple hardships. It is already a region that is depending on UN agencies and also international organizations for aid. Um, a lot of, about 80% of the population in Northwest Syria lives below the poverty line. So you can only imagine this compounded with the effects of the earthquake, the results that this would have caused. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I know you've already endured great suffering through the, uh, as a result of incendiary weapons and the, it's heartbreaking to think what you and your family have suffered as a result of the, of the recent tragedy. Um, so thank you for sharing that, that, that difficult story. Amar, um, could you tell us about the Syrian, Syrian civil defense's response in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake and what kind of challenges you've been facing uh, in addressing that? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so honored to be part of this. Actually, as my friend Abdul Karim said, there is no good or bad time for earthquake. But the earthquake came at the worst time ever, uh, where we were facing the cholera uh, pandemic, uh, the the also the snowstorm, storm after storm. So the population, the people was tired. The infrastructure was weak. And also we ourselves, the White Summers and other humanitarian organization were facing a critical financial situation. Before the earthquake, just before the earthquake, we, um, uh, we, we forced to uh, close out many center, uh, and many tens of, of vehicles were, were need uh, repair without, uh, because they were breaking out. So the earthquake came at the, at the worst time ever in, uh, in this area. At the beginning of the, uh, the the first hours of the earthquake, I remember we um, we were disappointed. We we were like uh, paralyzed to uh, to meet and to face all the mountain of rubble. This is the first time, like it it like a big bomb hit all the area. So this is the first time for us to deal with this number of rubble. We used to deal with rubble during the 12 years, but neighborhood, just neighborhood, just. I remember in Aleppo, the city where, uh, where, where Russian uh, launched uh, a military campaign. It was similar, but in, 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 in scale, it was big scale uh, in, in this uh, time. So 
we declared uh, in, uh, a, a state of emergency. We asked the international community, the UN, every humanitarian organization to deliver uh, rescue teams because our number is not enough, is not sufficient to deal with all that scale of destruction. Uh, 60, more than 60 communities, uh, people under the rubble, uh, we, we were hearing their voices all the time, uh, people asking us a lot of call from the people to deal with all that uh, at the same time. So we were facing the time uh, to uh, save lives. But if aid, if equipment, if heavy vehicles, if uh, search and rescue teams arrived at the time, things would be different. The future of those under the rubble would be different. So the community, the people around the world who help. So the state, uh, the, the, the international or uh, the state system failed the Syrian people, but the people system, the people around the, the world who respond uh, to save Syrian, save Syrian and the people who help also to save the Syrian. We thank all the people around the world who donate, who advocate and uh, raise our voices. Uh, to shed the light on, on uh, the situation here. We saw uh, teams, uh, international rescue teams in, the, in Turkey, in Damascus, but uh, we, we did not see any teams inside Syria. So the earthquake bus, the border, but the teams, international team did not uh, come to, to this area. So we were able to save more than 3,000 3, lives from under the rubble during the, uh, the, the, five, the fifth, fifth day. But unfortunately, many people die because we uh, came too late to them. So this, this is uh, the, the first, uh, first, first week of, of response. After the, the first week, we uh, lose the hope, we lost the hope to find any survival under the rubble as uh, time passed, uh, the hope and opportunity to find people diminished. Um, and we were able after the second week to recover all the dead body from under the rubble and bury them. Thank you. And, and thank you for all your the work that the White Helmets have done. It's, it's you know, deeply concerning about the limitations of the international response, but also inspiring to think of the work of your group and other, as you said, the, the people individual people that have made a difference in this in this situation. Um, Alex, turning to you, uh, you've worked specifically with the refugee population, and I was wondering if you could speak to the problems they face in particular and what their needs are at this point. Definitely. Thank you so much for, for having me, and thank you to everyone who helped organize this um, important discussion and for really including Syr Syrian voices um, on this panel. Um, so when it comes to the needs of refugees, I think it's important just to note that the areas that were most impacted by this earthquake were areas that were closest to the Syrian Turkish border. And so we have needs of Syrian refugees who are in Turkey, um, but also needs of the internally displaced persons in Syria, as Abdel Karim uh, mentioned. And both of, the, of these communities are now being displaced for a second, third, or fourth time since the start of, of the war began. Um, and so when it comes to the needs of Syrian refugees specifically, um, it's important to note that Turkey continues to host the largest number of refugees worldwide. Since the start of the civil war in 2011, about 3.6 million people had fled from Syria to Turkey, according to the UN uh, Refugee Agency. And um, it's important to note that this number represents only the number of the registered refugees only. So I suspect that the figures are much higher. Um, about of these half of these refugees, uh, so about half of this 3.6 million figure were living in areas that were close to the earthquake epicenter and now live in a region with destroyed buildings, destroyed hospitals and roads. Um, and so we have the immediate needs, obviously, when it comes to food, shelter, housing, heating, because of the cold uh, winter weathers. We have, um, you know, with food supplies and basic services that are stretched and anti-refugee sentiments that are running high. Um, many Syrians feel increasingly unwelcomed, um, and the president... Uh, Erdogan is under political pressure to put Turks first as the presidential elections approach later this year. So um, on top of the immediate needs, we have discrimination that is being felt by the Syrian community, which is coming both from 
the uh, Turkish population and also the author authorities in Gaziantep and Hatay, which are among the top provinces for Syrian residents. There are accounts from several Syrians saying that there were recent targets of hate speech, um, also that were affected by the earthquakes and uh, competitions for government aid. Um, and then there have also been accounts of uh, challenges which include restrictions on uh, coming and going from certain refugee camps, like the one in, in Nizib. You have the immediate needs, uh, which Ahmad talked about, and also the mental health needs. Uh, significant levels of trauma brought on by uh, many years of war um, on top of uh, seeing family members and tens of thousands of, of lost lives, leaving this population more vulnerable than ever. And then lastly, we have the economic impacts. So the area affected in Turkey here uh, generated almost 10% of the GDP in Turkey and 9% of, it, of its exports. And so at some point, uh, when we start focusing on um, the second phase of, of this crisis and really start thinking about reconstruction, um, I think it's, it'll be really important to consider how to best integrate refugees into these regional reconstruction plans. Um, because before this month, many had found work, they had their own sources of accommodation, and now are left homeless. And so it'll be really important to try and find uh, ways to ensure that the Turkish government is held accountable um, to the, the needs of refugees and that they're really at the forefront um, and remain you know, considered um, as, as we think of, of uh, the response to this crisis. Thanks, Alex. And, and thanks not only for raising some of the issues for, for uh, refugees and internally displaced persons, but also some of the, the breadth of the concerns, the physical, the psychological, socioeconomic, which are faced by any, any person affected by the earthquake or the, and or the armed conflict uh, in Syria. Uh, Mohammed, I want to turn back to you. And I was wondering, you talked a lot about what's your situ how you were affected by the earthquake on the day of the earthquake. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your situation today, three weeks later, uh, and a week after another earthquake hit the region. How, how is your family doing today? And what are your concerns going forward? Mohammed, ma huwa wada al yom bi Surya, thirat asabia ba'da zilzal al awal, wa isbu'a ba'da zilzal al ta'alim. Okay. Al wada khalina al ul. شمال غرب سوريا بالمن بالكامل أصبحت منطقة منكوبة كثير من العائلات حاليا خايفة ترجع لبيوتها أعداد كبيرة من البيوت بعد إشراف الفرق الهندسية على أنت منازل غير صالحة للسكن أو منازل تحتاج إعادة ترميم. So now I would say that northwest Syria is in complete rubble. Not just when it comes to infrastructure, but also the civilians and the people living there are scared and terrified to return home. The infrastructure has been destroyed, so a lot of the buildings need to be rebuilt and the people need to be rehoused. Uh, عدد كبير من خلينا نقول المنظمات سحبت كميات كبيرة من الأسواق دون دخول كميات جديدة من المعابر أو مساعدات إنسانية بشكل كافي للمنطقة من قبل الأمم المتحدة أو المنظمات الدولية الثانية. There's also a large depletion in terms of food and foods and food supplies when the earthquake. Hit a lot of the NGOs and the international organizations had bought out a lot of the food that was located in the different stores without sort of replenishing that supply through international aid or international supply. Uh, إنه الأمم المتحدة تأخرت كتير بطرح المواد الغذائية وبعض المواد الثانية هي عن طريق المعبر والكميات اللي دخلت خلينا نقول صغيرة بشكل نسبة على كمية الكارثة الكبيرة أدى نقص المواد الغذائية الأساسية من الأسواق وارتفاع أسعارها. So this could be attributed to the delay in the United Nations resupplying the food that was taken out. Um, through through the different international borders, and even the food that it, food supply that is coming in is not enough to 
sort of address the need in, in, in the region. And because of this, all, because of this, the prices have spiked as well. كما انه اعداد كبيره لحد الان من المتضررين من الزلزال ما حصلوا على اي مساعدات انسانيه ما قدمت لهم انا شخصيا عبر دائره علاقاتي الضيقه so a lot of people a lot of people to this day i mean three weeks after the first major earthquake and the week after the subsequent earthquakes has still have not received any sort of international aid or any aid in general i have been able to receive at least some because of my own personal relationships with the, within these humanitarian spaces كثير عائلات إلى الآن عم تنام بسياراتها خصوصا الأطفال في سوريا مجرد إنه يرجعوا على البيت وكانت هاي المنازل بأبنية طابقية عالية حتى لو ما حصل أي هزة ارتدادية أو كان الوضع آمن نوعا ما هن بصير عندهم حالات بكاء شديد حالات خوف شديد عم بيطلبوا من أهاليهم إنه أخرجوا من المنزل So a lot of people are still to this day sleeping in cars, and many of them with young children, not necessarily because of the destruction that happened in their buildings, but also because of the, the anxiety and the phobia that comes up, that came afterwards. Uh لحد الان مثل ما قلت في البدايه انه uh, المساعدات جدا خفيفه uh, جدا ضعيفه um, ما بتبشر باي خير خلينا نقول انه نحن متعودين على الامم المتحده انه هي تقدم مساعدات عاجله في اي ازمه بتصيب المنطقه وبعدين ما نشوف اي برامج انعاش او اعاده اعمار في المنطقه. So let's just say that the aid coming in now has been very, very weak at best. We are used to the United Nations coming in with international aid that tends to be immediate, immediate but we do not see long-term reconstruction efforts on on behalf of the United Nations within the region or reconstruction efforts that include refugees or the affected population. If you think that the house is made from two houses or a house is made from three or four houses, you can see that you can see four or five houses in the next few years. So you can imagine a home that only has two rooms that is originally intended to only house one family, now is housing four or five families. طبعا ممكن تشوفوا انه في مبالغه بالكلام ولكن الحدود السوريه التركيه حاليا مفتوحه لاي وفد اممي بحب يزور المنطقه واي شخص اجنبي وفيكم اي شخص فيه يزور المنطقه ويتاكد من هذا الكلام على ارض الواقع. So you might think that what I'm saying is an exaggeration or that I'm being hyperbolic, but as of now, The borders between Syria and Turkey are open, so I welcome any of you guys to come and to see the situation yourself. الوضع جدا مأساوي بالنسبه للاطفال، كثير من الاطفال عم ترفض بشكل قاطع انه تدخل المنازل بعد ما شافته من الزلزال الاول والثاني. So I just wanted to echo what Alex said earlier about the need for mental health efforts within the region, as of especially with younger children and older adults or or people that are older in age. As of now, a lot of children are completely refusing to enter into any building and are just staying outside or in their cars. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And I, I don't, I don't doubt your description at all, and I certainly don't think you're being hyperbolic. Um, I think that you raise a number of important concerns. And and building on that, um, Amar, from the White Helmets perspective, um, have you seen? You talked a little bit about this before. Mohammed's raised these issues, but what kinds of ongoing support have, do you need? And and also looking forward, what kind of support do um, White Helmets or other aid groups? need from the international community? Yes, life will continue, especially for the survival. Right now, the infrastructure um, damaged. Right now, there is, uh, you can say, the, the sewage, uh, the sewage is, is destructed and damaged, and uh, there is mixing with the water, uh, drinking water. So there is uh, the, the fire of uh, environmental, the fear of environmental uh, catastrophe. 
so uh, rehabilitating the, the infrastructure is so important. The schools, uh, most of the schools uh, are damaged. So that's uh, what entail uh, children will not go to school when the school uh, is open. Hospital, more than 57, uh, 57 hospitals uh, partially damaged by the earthquake. Uh, so we need every uh, possible uh, support to rehabilitate uh, the, the infrastructure inside Syria for, uh, for the people uh, to continue their life. More than 40,000 families are homeless. They need shelter, they need sanitation, they need wash. Those uh, tend to uh, uh, quickly. Uh, right now, there is no access to wash or, or sanitation. They need sanitation and wash. So life will continue. Also, the, 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 what, what Muhammad speak about is the, the people who survive from the earthquake need the care. More than 12,000 injuries need to be uh, need need care need doctors need uh, field hospital right now there is no um, access to turkey so, uh, turkey before the earthquake we're playing an important uh, role um, during the crisis in this area by uh, transferring patient to the hospital to the turkish hospital right now there is no way uh, it's uh, it's a block so even people with chronic disease like diabetes like cancer right now people with cancer need uh, their, do their dose their need, need the medicine. So uh, we need everything uh, in this area right now. Um, we fear of of uh, of this ease. We fear, be, as I, I said, the cholera before the earthquake, there was more than 500 uh, infectious cases in this area. So we we are in need of everything. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I want to turn to you, uh, Kareem. Um, looking at some of the, the political ramifications of the armed conflict. And in the aftermath of the earthquake, there's been some renewed debate about the sanctions that were imposed on Syria as a result of the Assad's regime conduct during the conflict. Um, both the US and the EU have eased some of the sanctions to facilitate aid delivery, but the Assad regime is using the earthquake to call for lifting sanctions entirely. And I was wondering what your perspective was on, on these debates. Um, Ria, thank you for this question. Um, and I think um, the Assad regime, since the earthquake struck, um, has seen this disaster as an opportunity for them to ask for more normalization with a regime that committed a lot of uh, what can be described as war crimes, including the use of chemical weapons, including mass human rights violations. And the, the narrative that the Syrian regime and their allies has been, they've been trying to uh, populate is that um, sanctions prevent humanitarian aid, which is uh, not true. The sanctions, the, either the US sanctions or the EU, the UK, all of these sanctions have very um, clear exceptions for humanitarian and medical aid, which means that I do not think that sanctions by itself are the main reason behind hindering the response um, activities. It is quite the contrary. I think the Syrian regime itself played a role in um, hindering the, re the response um, activities. In day uh, one to day three after the earthquake, there was a cross-line uh, convoy that was prepared to be sent from regime-held areas to the um, affected areas in northwest of Syria. But this convoy was stopped under the order by the um, governor of Aleppo, and they were waiting further confirmations from the palace in Damascus. So the, the narrative that the Syrian regime were trying to say that the, they are in Damascus are able to lead the um, emergency interventions um, relying on cross-line um, delivery, which means aid being delivered to the affected areas in northwest of Syria, uh, crossing the conflict line from, from the regime held areas to Bosnian held areas. I think the whole narrative is really uh, politicized by the same regime and their allies. Although now the US and the EU partners, they issued different, several general licensing to, uh, ex to have exceptions for the humanitarian aid 
to, to go to the affected areas in the whole country um, and also to grant some exceptions from the sanctions. I do not think the problem is the sanctions itself. It is the history of the same regime by manipulating, man manipulating and politicizing the um, humanitarian aid. And there is there is a lot of um, research and investigating investigations around the manipulation of aid by the Assad regime and their and their allies. Uh, so it is the, the issue of um, ensuring accountability when it comes to handing over uh, aid resources to um, a regime like uh, Assad regime. And that's why I think it is important to mention um, the, the issue of how to deliver aid to the different affected areas in Syria at this at this very very you know important time. So we've been um, conducting some research over the last few years about the governance of the different entities within uh, in Syria within the different areas of control, and especially in the north state areas in northwest of Syria. And I think the international community now should engage at a much lower level, at a decentralized lower level with the humanitarian actors, with the civil society actors, and also with the technical cozy governmental bodies like the White Helmets, who've been doing great job in terms of filling the gaps that are generated by having no government in northwest of Syria. So I think any claim by the Damascus government that they are able to access or to cover the affected areas in the northwest of Syria, I think this claims uh, lack any credibility. And we've seen that actors like the White Helmets or the different Syrian NGOs on the ground, they are the ones who were the backbone of the humanitarian response over the last 12 years, and they are now the first responders. So I think the international community should uh, identify a new modality on how to engage in a disaster relief response in areas affected by conflict where there is no government. I think this is the time to think about this. The White Helmets provided a good example of a Gozi governmental body or a technical body that has no political affiliation, but yet has the legitimacy from the ground and has the support from the community. And I think if we build on that model, I think this, this will ensure that aid is delivered to the affected population in the best manner in such contested conflict area. Thanks, Karim. Not just for addressing the perspective of the sanctions question, but also for offering some, some alternative approaches to delivering the aid. And Alex, I want to ask you, um, some worry that the Assad regime is instrumentalizing, as, as Karim discussed, the earthquake to regain a foothold on the international stage. Um, how do you think the humanitarians can navigate this space to ensure that aid is not politicized? And, and how would you balance these concerns with the potential necessity to work with the regime to open cross-border cross routes and facilitate access to humanitarian aid in regime-held areas, including Aleppo? Yeah, no, definitely. It's um, definitely a complex um, question with, with many layers. Um, and I think I'm probably going to respond from, from more of a humanitarian um, slash human rights lawyer perspective. Um, I think when it comes to the, the response, human rights must be at the, at the heart of this crisis response. So we know that there's a record of past and ongoing human rights abuses um, in Syria that have occurred by um, you know, the regime and, and others, um, and largely directed at the Syrian people, which poses several uh, risks for humanitarian organizations, UN agencies, and donors. Um, however, when it comes to humanitarian aid delivery, I think it's important to adopt a needs-based response rather than an access-based response, because as we have seen, this has been um, really inadequate at meeting the tremendous needs, both, you know, whether it's in the Northwest area or it's in um, areas that were also affected, but under that are, you know, that happened to be under the regime's control. I think aid should be conditioned on the respect for human rights. Uh, we need a response that's based on the needs of those most affected and one that allows you to reach as many people as um, possible. And there are ways that this can be done. Um, I know that, you know, the U.S. has um, that has contributed around 185 uh, million, I believe, uh, dollars to uh, both countries in Turkey and, and Syria. 
but there no, there's no oversight uh, to how this money is going to be delivered or any kind of accountability mechanism. So we can start with that. We can start with conducting uh, due, digital, due diligence. Actors in Syria should conduct a full, full due diligence uh, process and understand that there may be potential human rights risks and abuses may arise um, out of supporting certain projects. Um, ensuring that programming, again, is based on the most, most urgent needs um, through a triaging process and without discrimination or political considerations, ensuring that um, the partners that are working, um, that it's a localized response and um, that the parties that you're working with are uh, not subjects to human rights sanctions or that there's no evidence um, that those actors have committed serious human rights abuses. Um, and lastly, also operate transparently and ensure that, again, there's some kind of accountability mechanism, um, whether that's by having um, a, you know, a standard human rights committee or uh, a compliance committee that can oversee this operation, I think is key. Um, looking through applying it from a human rights lens and, a hum and based on humanitarian principles. Great, thank you, Alex. And it's, it's a challenging situation to depoliticize and I appreciate your suggestions for, for making, for focusing on the human rights and, and victim-centered approach. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I want to, for those of you in the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the in the Q and A box um, that's on your on your Zoom screen. Um, uh, I know students want to go to class in five or ten minutes, so if there's any questions in the room, feel free to raise your hand now. Around, um, that I will, yeah, go ahead there. And if, I don't know if you have any mic, so keep it short, and I will repeat it to the webinar group. So. I want to say thank you so much for all of you taking time to talk with us today. I think as law students, we saw after the earthquake of the other of the international community to respond to the most vulnerable in Syria. And so I was just wondering what do you guys think is like something worthwhile that we can do as law students to highlight the play of the Syrian refugees in the international community? I guess more like long term because I'm someone who's interested in like human rights work um, equally, but also then I'm seeing like how the UN has been in our body for the family on um, Syrians. So, like, what are other avenues I can be more effective? Great, thank you. So, um, I'm just going to repeat the question. I'm sorry we, we don't have a mic, but um, basically, the question was that uh, first of all, thank you all for your comments. And the question was as law students, what can um, be done? What can law students do to uh, highlight the, the, issue, the situations of Syrian refugees and IDPs um, over the long term and improve their situations? So, um, any of you uh, may chime in. Um, questions open. Anyone? Any one of the panelists? Uh, feel free to sort of speak up. Anyone wants to take that question? Yeah, maybe I, I will go um, as maybe other other panelists um, can think of a um, an answer. I think uh, the first thing that came to mind is definitely maybe um, donations to the um, uh, organizations who are credible, but really about identifying the right channel, which is really important. Um, and then I think it is about um, advocacy with the right political channels within within the US because as we explained it is a contested conflict area it's not like a normal natural disaster that happens in a country that has a legitimate government that can respond uh, we need an advocacy that um, that aids uh, from government and from the international community reach to the the, the uh, people as Alex mentioned on need spaces um, and I think this will uh, necessitate some work to be done by the governments in terms of um, understanding the political uh, process within Syria, maybe activating even the political transition now, because as you know, Syria, uh, there was a, a resolution by the Security Council, um, which is 2254, on um, a political transition that is needed in Syria. And I think this is the time really to think about reactivating the political process and advocacy to um, 
to activate this drug while uh, to confront maybe the narrative by the Russians and the, the Syrian regime allies that to freeze uh, this political transition um, uh, issue and also start normalization process, which I think this will leave the victims of the earthquake really with um, without the needed support on the long run, because we're not talking here about only the short term needs in the first few weeks after the earthquake, but we talk about, you know, a mid term to long term okay. needs that really require months and years to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to also add to that. Um, I think I think also from a U.S. kind of perspective, it's important, as uh, Abdul Karim mentioned, to really continue to show interest in this issue, um, whether it's by meeting with your congressional representatives, writing to them to ensure really that Syria remains at the forefront of um, their minds for at least the next few months and also for the recovery phase. Uh, you know, this is going to take many, many months um, and many even years to come. Um, also, if, if, if you're interested, please uh, feel free to, to uh, reach out to Bonnie to connect us. I'm currently working on an initiative with uh, a few colleagues and friends to try and find ways to continue this momentum. Um, on the crisis, because as media attention fails, uh, as media attention fades, um, that's really when when people on the ground are going to need us the most, um, because funding is going to stop trickling in and um, donations are going to stop trickling in. And I think it's important to really think of of this more from a long term uh, perspective. And and I'd be happy to to chat on on some ways that that we can work together. Thanks. And maybe I'll, I've got a question in the in the chat from someone on the webinar, uh, and it's open to anybody. But maybe I'll I'll turn to Mohammed or Omar, some people on the ground. Um, it says, "Thank you so much for the really powerful conversation, for your work, and for your time. In these extraordinarily difficult circumstances, how do you stay motivated in your work and stay hopeful about a better future for Syria?" So again, open to anybody, but. Um, particularly if Amr or Mohammed would like to respond, but again, open to anybody. I want to chime in on that. I'm not sure whether Mohammed needs maybe a translation for the question oh, just to engage Mohammed in the- Susan? Yes, I, I just translated the question to him, so he should be ready to answer. Sure. Thank you. Uh, go <laughs> اه اوكي بالتاكيد ما فينا انه نحن نفقد الامل مهما صار يعني مهما اشتدت حده القصف من قبل نظام اسد والميليشيات الروسيه والايرانيه المسانده له او بالكوارث الطبيعيه اللي ضربت المنطقه so first we cannot lose hope with no matter what happens after, especially after Assad regime has bombed and shelled most most of the region, we were still remained hopeful. Uh, we cannot lose hope, no, again, no matter what happens, whoever died, God, God bless them and may they rest in peace and whoever is still alive, we help them by hosting events and panels such as this one. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, أو كان عن طريق التبرع لأي جهة تشوف هو مناسبة طبعا الدفاع المدني السوري اللي هو الخواز البيضاء بكل تأكيد قدم جهود جبارة في المنطقة. Yes, and we can remain involved through 
accepting donations or contributing financially to the Syrian Defense Fund or the White Helmets who have been instrumental in, in providing aid to, to those affected. ما فينا نحن نفقد الأمل لأنه بالأخير مطالبنا لما أخرجنا هي كانت تطبيق العدالة والكرامة وحرية الرأي في سوريا نجل هاي القضية مستعدين نحن نتحمل المصاعب اللي عم بتصير في المنطقة أجل توصيل رسالتنا الصحيحة. Yes, so when we first went to the streets in the in the early 2000s, we were asking for human dignity and for for respect. And this is a this is a ask that we are still holding on to. And we are willing to sort of accept or with or accept these challenges that, that come to us because of this call and because of the call that we still hold on to. Okay. Can I, I add something? Go ahead, Omar. Uh, this is so difficult a question. We uh, usually be asked by this question. When when I started, I will speak uh, personally. When I started the job in the White Helmets in 2013, I thought that this is just for two weeks, two months, one year, not more than that. But uh, because of the of the need on the ground, the scale of destruction, the scale of attacks, um, I we continue the job having the uh, the training, the equipment, blah, 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 uh, et cetera. But um, what uh, motivates us to uh, keep uh, doing this job is when you get somebody from under the liberal life, this is a moment of joy, victory, and happiness. This is, uh, can you imagine this moment when, you, when you're when working for six hours, for example, in one area, we were working in six hours, uh, after six hours, we get uh, a girl, alive from under the rubble. So this is moment can uh, motivate all the people around us, not only us to keep uh, doing this job, but also we face a uh, tragic incident, tragic story all, all the time too. Thank you. Um, thank you, Omar, and thank you, Mohammed, for your, your thoughtful responses. I think, fortunately, we're out of time. Um, we put a couple, there was, I don't have time to go through all the questions. There was one final question. There's another question about how to make, choose who to make donations to. The White Helmets is certainly a very worthy cause. Um, for those of you on campus, I encourage you to reach out to Manal Sada, one of our co-sponsors, who has a, a list of worthy, worthy organiz other worthy organizations. Um, we put in the chat, uh, for those of you on the webinar, um, emails from myself. Um, I don't have a list, but I can connect you with people who do. And uh, Alex's email as well. Um, and I'm sure other panelists would be willing to speak with you as well, and I can connect you. Um, so thank you very much to those of you online. Thanks to all the panelists, um, and thanks to you in the room. Uh, I appreciate panelists calling in from UK, from DC, and most importantly from Syria for all your hard work on this issue. Um, stay safe, and uh, I hope that the situation in Syria will improve in the coming months, um, and hopefully as soon as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.